thank you in the name of God, the most merciful, most compassionate. We welcome you to the first session of this conference, uh, which coincides with many changes, important changes at the Arab level as well as the regional Gulf level. The theme of this first session relates to issues of identity, and we know uh, that uh, a number of uh, the conflicts which uh, has been taking place within parts of uh, this region have impacted the and exasperated the question of uh, identity. In this session, we have four speakers. We will start with uh, Dr. Ali Muhammad Fakhra. Dr. Ali Muhammad Fakhra is a well-known thinker and researcher in Bahrain and the Gulf region. He was uh, Minister of Health and Education for over 25 years in Bahrain. He was ambassador in France for a long period, and also he was the director of the Board of Governors for Bahrain Research Center. I'll give him the floor now, and he has 15 minutes to deliver his paper. In the name of God, the most merciful, most compassionate, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to express my gratitude for inviting me to this conference, and my thanks go to Qatar, its Emir, its government, its people, and everybody who helped organize this conference. I would like to talk about the challenges to the identity of GCC and GCC countries. I don't think an issue like this can be dealt with in any way but uh, total frankness and candid discussion. Discussion. This is no longer a political issue only, it's an existential issue for this part of the world. The Arab presence in this area in the foreseeable future will depend on solving this problem correctly and fairly. We know this area was not inhabited by a large number of people. It's all, the population has always been scarce when it was poor economically, but after the discovery of oil, an economic boom took place as a result of the windfall of fortunes and wealth, as a result of exporting oil and gas, and this led to invite a large number of workers from outside the region. But the problem was due to the question that what, what kind of workers and which part of the world there were, in my opinion, three problems. First of all, the, the officials and the policy makers of this area were, were, were not committed to pan-Arabism as much as they should have been. Secondly, the type of economy which, uh, which uh, was practiced in this part of the world and what kind of uh, economic thinking should prevail in this part of the world. And I think this, this aspect of things has been closely linked to the idea that uh, these communities have not been treated as communities with dreams, ambitions, history, and 
uh, belonging to the Arab world, they were treated as uh, companies or uh, workers' camps dealt with on the basis of uh, winning or losing, profit making, and so therefore, at, uh, when it comes to moral and ethical issues, and after that we are faced with the winds of globalization blowing in this direction, bringing with them different commitments and different problems. I don't want to delve into details about the definition of identity, but there are at least two main important issues here. First of all, the Arab language as a major constituent of the identity, and secondly, the Arab culture. As a result of this, and uh, so far as the problems faced by the identity of the GCC are faced, there are four themes. First of all, is the, the population question. Some statistics show in the 50s, the number of GCC countries, the total number of population in all GCC countries was estimated to be around 7 million, including 2 million expat community workers, meaning that the foreign workers represented 29 or 30 percent of the total population. 2008, however, the percentage of the foreign workers to the total number of population has become 69%. So there was a huge leap from 29% to 69%. The vast majority of this foreign workforce, if it were uh, Arab workers, then no danger would have been there for the identity. But uh, over 90 or 95 percent were non-Arabic speakers and belonged to a different culture and therefore producing some problems. <coughs> if we try and uh, explore the future now and say that uh, if the current uh, trend prevails and continues at the same pace, and if we estimate the foreign workforce to represent 69%, what will the situation be like in the future? 80-90% of non-Arabs? This is, this is the question which is causing a lot of concern. In addition, let's remember that the United Nations and human rights organizations started saying that uh, workers who work in foreign countries are entitled to be naturalized as citizens and they have, should have the right to elect the municipalities and other types of elections. Also, nowadays, the, uh, some people are even demanding that uh, these foreign workers should be represented in our parliaments or shura councils, whether elected or appointed. And this is a very dangerous threat because the work for, um, and whenever I mean, whenever I say foreign workforce, I mean non-Arabs by that. Let's pose another question. Will, in the future, the number of uh, this foreign workforce uh, will expand or uh, will decrease, increase or decrease? I think reality tells us that they will not uh, decrease because the estimated trillion dollars or so 
which will be spent here will produce a new economy. Maybe we will move into more productive economy, and this will require establishing more factories, and this will require also foreign workers. And also, we will still need services, and these services will not be provided except through foreign workers. So therefore, we are faced with a very dangerous situation because all the projections indicate that the foreign, foreign workers are given five minutes. So therefore, I will move quickly to the second problem. The second problem pertains to the economy. We are here since the discovery of oil in 1981. The General Secretariat of the GCC asked a number of uh, thinkers and writers in this area to write a, a paper about uh, a strategy for development. In my opinion, it was a wonderful uh, paper, and they recommended that income from petrol and revenues from oil should be public property, and there should be also real attempts uh, at uh, a more productive industry and economy. And also, there was a recommendation to reduce the number of foreign workers. This was also ignored. Also, number four, they recommended linking public expenditure to the needs of society. This was ignored. Also, a recommendation to reform the management and the, the administration of the state. This was not taken. This has not taken place. Also, to create an environment for enhancing a real Arab culture. This has not been done. We have a problem here, a basic problem, because the economy is run with a purely commercial attitude and a globalized attitude which says that the market can control itself and it can organize its own affairs. So therefore, the state should not interfere and the money should go into the private sector and the private sector is capable of solving its own problems. The other problem is a political one. I said right from the start that this problem wouldn't have been created if the authorities in this part of the world brought Arab workers, even the ones who were not skilled enough to be, to be trained and naturalized, the ones who wanted to be naturalized. If we were to do that, then we wouldn't have been facing the problems today. But the problem is they looked at this from two different angles. They thought if the Arab workers come here, they'll bring their own political problems, so therefore we should avoid that. And secondly, when, the, for example, when they have a problem with the government in Egypt, Morocco, or Iraq, then citizens of these countries should not be brought into this country, and they automatically treat the problem with the government as problems with its citizens. Another point is that the GCC was established to unite these countries, because if that were to happen, at least countries like Qatar and uh, UAE with a number of uh, foreign pop members of population exceeding 80%, then there will be no problems. But uh, with the passage of time, now, in fact, since 1981, uh, there's been many statements saying that the GCC as uh, a council to coordinate, not unite uh, these countries. Although it's uh, 
chapter says otherwise, and there should have been steps to have a single currency and other issues. And today, on top of the political problems, we have a situation whereby the members of the GCC now think that uh, their, each country's national sovereignty should come first. And I don't think that's a recipe for unity. Now we come to the most important point, and that's pertaining to culture. And here I want to emphasize on the Arabic as a language. Since globalization, the Arab GCC countries have been giving up um, their own responsibility for education and health services. Now we see foreign schools are expanding and the Arabic language is the first victim. Maybe we can uh, talk more about this in the discussion, but the, the solution is there. GCC countries can make it a condition that every pupil who graduates from a private secondary school should take an exam set by the state in the Arabic language. If he or she passes, no problem. If they place this condition, then all schools will need to do something about this to enhance the curriculum for Arabic and uh, will provide them with the minimum, the absolute bare minimum of things which uh, pertain to language, religion, and other aspects of culture. But unfortunately, this is not happening, and here we have the mother of all problems. Because a student who cannot speak his national language cannot uh, have uh, read the Quran or read any good uh, source of literature or read a good can only read the Washington Post and other sources of knowledge and representatives of other cultures. So I'll conclude by saying that there is a lot of money here. There is uh, uh, tremendous economic activity, continuous building space. And in fact, this is adding to the problem of uh, defect in the population because, because you don't only require people to build these buildings, but you want people to occupy them. And I've spoken to many, to many officials. They, 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 they want the population to be 10 million and they have a few thousand. This means they have to bring nine and a half million people from abroad to reside in this country. Personally, I don't think the ruling classes in the GCC are aware of the threat facing them in the future. Our hope is that the people in this part of the world will understand and move. Sorry, Chair, for taking too much time. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ali, for abiding by the time. The next paper is, being, is going to be delivered by uh, Dr. Asma Alatiya, and uh, Dr. Asma Abdullah Alatiya is the head of the Department of Psychological Sciences at the College of Education for Qatar University, and she is also a member of, uh, of the Qatar National Committee for Human Rights, and she has published uh, research in Arab and foreign specialized scientific journals, and uh, she deals with uh, education, and uh, her paper will be tackling the issue of the challenges of the identity in the GCC countries in light of a changing world, the diverse world and the multicultural world. We'll allocate 15 minutes for the doctor. Please, the floor is yours. In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful praise be to our master, Prophet Muhammad, his uh, companions and his households.
uh, a caveat before I start. Uh, before those who do not uh, praise uh, humans, do not praise God, I would like to extend my gratitude for the center, for the invitation, the generous invitation. When it comes to the identity, there are two attitudes uh, that pertain to the identity per se. If we talk about the history, history and humans are two coins uh, of the same currency. Humans, uh, as a matter of fact, write down history and history. Uh, 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 touches upon the achievements of humans. Um, as we know, uh, history has been made by men. We do not mean men as in males, but males and females, uh, obviously. I met uh, Dr. Azmi Bishara through the social media outlets uh, and through Al Jazeera, and I wanted to meet this man. I uh, was invited uh, to participate in a conference in 2011-2012, and I dealt with the first uh, uh, paper that I presented in the first conference of uh, that uh, tackled the issue of identity. The Dr. Nora was there, and we talked about the identity, and our talk was exciting. This. Uh, uh, was the first conference uh, that tackled the issue of the identity. The second conference took place uh, two years ago, and at the same uh, induction session, uh, I participated, and Mr. Najjar was also a colleague of us uh, who participated in the same session. As a matter of fact, uh, Dr. Ali Fakhru has shot all the foxes, and uh, uh, he uh, presented his paper uh, 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 splendidly, but I would like uh, to talk uh, from the psychological kind point of view when it comes to the identity from a psychological perspective and how it relates to the life uh, itself. Uh, uh, this is a prelude uh, to my talk, but Mr. Ali Fakhru has said uh, a lot of uh, uh, words uh, that relates uh, even to psychology. I would like to pose a question. Would it be possible for contemporary uh, 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 societies uh, to carry on uh, the same way, or do they have to think from outside the box? Uh, here, uh, our children are attached to uh, accuracy, uh, real information, and real-time uh, images and social media. These attributes uh, are have been conveyed to us through the genes, or are they to do with emotions and the sense of loyalty and uh, the uh, uh, meaning of life? Uh, so I think identity is uh, an umbrella. It uh, morphs into something else uh, day after day, and uh, it uh, uh, has been always propelled by uh, different uh, ideas, and those who follow the channels, unfortunately, some of the TV channels uh, uh, those who follow them, uh, they will understand that uh, some of them are toxic indeed, uh, some of the broadcasting content, uh, and uh, there are proponents, obviously, and opponents to such uh, uh, content of such channels. Uh, how could we build uh, an intellect or a thought? Because when we talk about identity, we, would, we talk about patterns, uh, trends, uh, and indeed, the ideas uh, have been transformed into emotions uh, that are propelled by conduct. Would it be possible to have an identity without knowing oneself? I need to know oneself. In the GCC countries, we have a similar culture, but every single country in the GCC is proud of its peculiar identity. But there are commonalities. Within the same country, we have commonalities, and we have, obviously, differences. Would it be possible for the identity to be transformed into uh, uh, an estrangement or uh, uh, an exclusion, uh, getting away from society or being cocooned or something like that. Uh, this uh, is a very important question. Would it be possible for the identity to transform into such matter? In the past, uh, we derived our knowledge uh, and we were nurtured uh, 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 on the basis of uh, the family and the sense of belonging. The sense of belonging has nothing to do with uh, a banner that I wave when I uh, 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 win in a football match or so on and so forth. No, it is to do with the development and the sustainable development. Would it be possible for our GCC uh, societies uh, 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 to become a coherent 
fabric where a roadmap uh, can reflect its identity. Now, I think this is a, a big question, and one day I think that this center will talk about citizenship because citizenship intertwines with the issue of the identity. The identity is, is to do with the self-consciousness. Sometimes, if we ask the new generations, what do you understand when it comes to identity? They would say, I'm Qatari, I'm Kuwaiti, I'm Bahraini. What is it to do with the citizenship? Identity equals citizenship. As a matter of fact, there are plenty of people who have dual citizenship or different citizenship. So how could we view them? I think uh, the sense of belonging plays a major role in morphing the identity and solidifying it. When it comes to the uh, uh, meaning of life, uh, the meaning of life plays a major role. Uh, indeed, uh, the language relates to the emotional uh, uh, intricacies of uh, the self-being, uh, because uh, the meaning of life also intertwines what we are talking about. I'm a cutter, for example. If I acquire or obtain a citizenship, what would this add to me to have more privileges or go back to the root causes of my identity or emphasize the meaning of life? When it comes to estrangement, uh, uh, it is to do with uh, sometimes uh, 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 being an exile in one of its meanings. Uh, uh, I'm not talking here about uh, diaspora or exile, no. I'm talking about being estranged inside your own country sometimes or indeed uh, uh, inside your own family because uh, uh, the uh, nurturing of uh, uh, the uh, wolf and the welfare of uh, oneself uh, uh, does not lead to being entrenched uh, uh, in uh, his or her society, being a Tunisian or a Palestinian or an Egyptian or an Emirati or a Qatari or so on and so forth. How or when can we express our identity? We can express our identity in three ways. Uh, perhaps uh, it is to do with the cultural nuances or when something takes place, then we take an off and defensive position. And sometimes we would like to surmount some challenges that also surface in our life. Our life today, everyone say, says it is quick, it is swift and uh, how could we uh, retreat and uh, pause and uh, ponder over our life? How can we meet our targets when we talk about sustainable development? Do we think that uh, these matters deal with the, with the matter of uh, preserving the identity? You've got five minutes, the chairman is saying. The lady is saying, yes, thank you. I'll finish soon. When it comes to uh, uh, speed, uh, uh, we suffer from speed. Perhaps this is an indication of the Arma Armageddon and the Day of Judgment. I don't know. But still, uh, we think that the means justify the end. And people are following a kind of a Machiavellian kind of uh, 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 point of view sometimes. But globalization indeed uh, uh, dissociates the people from their own society. And it has a negative effect from, I, from my own uh, perspective. When it comes to the identity, identity is a human value. Our societies uh, ought to be ready uh, uh, to uh, open, to be open to the other. Uh, 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 to stick to your identity doesn't mean that you have to be cocooned in your own uh, society because God has created man and man is the successor of God. And that's why this successor ought to uh, uh, be open-minded, albeit he or she ought to preserve their identity. When it comes uh, to uh, uh, some uh, uh, sh uh, the, the crisis of the identity, as we call it in psychology, uh, especially when it comes to uh, some shortcomings in the nurturing of uh, the child, when uh, we uh, think that we are exiled in our societies, uh, this uh, will lead to uh, indeed distorting the identity. When it comes to the Arabic language, the Arabic language is not only what we utter, but it is the language of the Holy Quran. It is the emotional language of the uh, 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 
Arabs in uh, a number of conferences, uh, people talk about the Arab language, but in reality, our children go indeed to English-speaking schools, uh, and when we speak to them in Arabic, they say, they say what does that mean in English? Uh, in our societies, as uh, Dr. Fakhru said, uh, we have plenty of laborers, we have plenty of workers, and he focused on the non-Arabs, uh, and even the those who speak Arabic uh, if uh, they come here, for example, they, uh, their Arabic will be uh, sometimes not up to the standards. When it comes uh, to uh, uh, foreign languages, we need to, uh, to be open to the foreign language, but not at the expense of the Arabic. Uh, the foreign workers that Dr. Fakhru has talked about uh, 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 this, uh, when it comes uh, to the uh, language of the broadcasting channels, especially when it comes to the Arab Spring, uh, the language indeed uh, has been utilized in order to destroy a number of concepts. Uh, the uh, new uh, uh, social media brings you the news in real time, and uh, when it comes to the schizophrenic kind of related conduct of one of of uh, 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 the people uh, nowadays uh, uh, has been uh, 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 witnessed. Uh, uh, sometimes uh, people are hypocrites. They talk about something, but they don't change the theory into practice. Uh, they don't practice what they preach. At the end of the day, we need to uh, focus on the uh, uh, openness. Uh, we need to focus on our Arabic language as a pan-Arabic uh, 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 tool. Uh, it is uh, the language of the Quran, uh, and it is the language of our culture, our civilizations. We need to entrench this uh, uh, component uh, to be more civilized. We need to understand what takes place in the world, and we need to have uh, specialized centers to focus on the identity issue. Identity issue has nothing to do with a garment uh, to wear, and so on and so forth. It needs to be a conduct. Uh, uh, and uh, the support of the concepts of uh, being proud of oneself. Uh, sometimes when I used to go to conferences, I would say uh, uh, plenty of uh, pundits, Arab pundits, they would say that we are Arabs uh, not up to the standards, but no, we need to be confident, we need to uh, stick to our guns, and we need to uh, uh, move forward and be proud of our Arabism. We do not have to belittle ourselves. We need to be confident uh, so that we can become the successors of God, as I said. We need to focus on the media uh, role, and uh, uh, lastly, we need uh, uh, to believe that uh, openness, interaction, and com competitiveness uh, are uh, 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 taken for granted in our days, but uh, we need to focus uh, on the uh, uh, what we have been given by God. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your listening. Thank you, Dr. Asma, for your presentation. Now we move to the third presentation by Dr. Fatma Sayer. She lectures at uh, the University of the United Arab Emirates, teaches history, and at the same time, she is uh, the publishing manager of a scientific journal on social sciences and has many papers on the history of the GCC and the United Arab Emirates and its contemporary history. She will be talking about uh, <coughs> questions on identity, citizenship, and the new challenges faced by the GCC country, <coughs> focusing in particular on the UAE. Thank you, and may the blessings of God be upon you all. Challenges of this sort are looked upon as the most important challenges faced by GCC countries in general and the UAE in particular. GCC countries and now are a testimony to the civilizational change and demographic change in the contemporary world. In the last few decades, uh, tremendous changes have taken place, uh, producing many 
social and economic side effects. Uh, GCC countries are considered amongst the most changing and changeable uh, societies and communities in the world from points of view of living standards, uh, civilizational values, and others. The changes that our countries have gone through lately have produced situations very different than the past. And in the United Arab Emirates, since uh, its existence in the beginning of the 70s, has been changing many political and economic uh, challenges. But this kind of change, this kind of challenge that we're talking about here is probably amongst the most important. My paper will try and shed light on the most Im important challenges faced by the GCC countries and what is called nowadays sustainable development. And also I will suggest some solutions which may be similar to what Dr. Ali Fakhru has said, and through this kind of vision we will try to find a way out of this identity crisis faced by our GCC countries. Of course, I'll have no time to read the paper in its entirety, but I'll just focus on some main points like as what Dr. Ali Fakhru has said, globalization, technological advancement, which has created many questions about the identity of the countries making up the GCC, and also the question of citizenship, the important, it has a very complex issue of citizenship at both regional, local, regional, and international level. I'll try and conclude by some proposals or suggestions. I, I wrote an introduction, but I will not read it. I said that the demographic makeup of the GCC countries are unique compared to the rest of the world because of the disparity in numbers, cultures, languages spoken, and this is a major source of concern. And this is the challenge emanates from the demographic situation and issues relating to development, like the lack of clearly set priorities and goals for development, and also the goals which have been set are not compatible to the needs of society, and this exasperated the, the, the question of the identity, so much so that now the number of the native uh, population of the UAE is, is not more than 15%, leaving 85%. The rest of the population are foreigners. And in 2008, the, the UAE declared the year 2008 a year for the national identity. And of course, not only the state is responsible for the identity crisis, the developments around us, the openness which the area has experienced and the problems which the entire region has been thrown into, and this led to a feeling that the situation threatens the very existence of the society and the identity of its future generations. And we know by identity, we don't mean just one aspect, but different aspects like citizenship. And this uh, has laid more emphasis on this and the necessity to find a solution for this problem. Of course, uh, this issue is not new so far as the UAE is concerned. It goes back to more than 
50 years when the British colonial control was still being exercised and they used to allow Asians unconditionally. And also the Arab identity of these areas, especially Dubai and Sharjah, were talked about uh, and the question persisted until the existence of the and the formation of the UAE and this of course uh, stressed the importance of uh, the demographic uh, makeup of the country and questions to do with citizenship so, some aspects of this are linked to government lands and unprecedented development on one side and on the other side the societal changes which have been taking place as a result of this boom in economic development. So therefore some solutions suggested that uh, for example the foreign workers should be placed with Arab workers like what Dr. Fakhru has suggested also more efforts, efforts into the revival of questions of culture, history, and uh, raise awareness, and also the, to aim for the kind of development which is only linked to the needs of people. And I'm summarizing here. Going back to the question of citizenship, in the Gulf areas in general, there has been a lot of talk about real citizenship, not just as a feeling of belonging and allegiance to the country, but as a, a, a question of identity. And the media of late, and as a result of the changes brought about by the Arab Spring and the Arab revolutions, and the tremendous debate surrounding this issue of citizenship, which changed it from a traditional definition of citizenship into something which is difficult to comprehend by civil activists now. Now citizenship is linked to the authority, the ruling authority, and the ideology more than belonging to the country as a land with people living on it. And maybe because of the recent changes brought about by the Arab revolutions, or because some people can only understand these issues from a very narrow, blinkered angle. And therefore, there has been a lot of interpretation and explanation, and this requires us really uh, to pause for one second and contemplate and think clearly and frankly and tell the citizen what you mean. For example, for a long time, the ruling authorities bought the allegiance of the citizen and uh, to move the allegiance from the tribe to the state and many privileges were, were given to the citizens of the country and the naturalized citizens only, not the rest of the population, the expat community. In the beginning, these privileges have enhanced allegiance to the state and the authority moved from the tribe to the state. The privileges at that time turned the term citizen into that which means welfare, security, peace of mind, privileges. And in the opinion of some, though it was like an open-ended financial commitment or an open check, and this has moved the traditional Gulf society from a society and a community owing its allegiance to a tribe to that which owes its allegiance to the state. And of course, this generosity by the ruling elites 
benefited from the boom in oil revenues and also in increased the kind of offerings by the state to its, its citizens, the amounts, the um, amount of money in cash privileges, accommodation, and other free services. This has also changed the concept of a traditional citizen, but uh, I don't know if I have time or not. You have two minutes. Okay, I'll move to the conclusion then. Uh, the paper deals with all the details, but we have no time for everything now, but it suffices to say that the challenges faced by the GCC countries in general and the UAE are very important and it's necessary to face up to them because the continuation of these challenges will not allow to have a sustainable economic development with a sustainable social development which protects the social cohesion and the relations between the different components of society and rid our societies of the causes of concern. And we must also establish and enhance a new concept for citizenship. And thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fatima. Thank you for abiding by the time. The last paper in this session will be delivered by Dr. Ashraf Osman. Uh, Dr. Ashraf is a, a professor of political sociology at the Ghadarif University in Sudan, and he has worked as the director of the University Center for Peace Studies and Development uh, in the same university, uh, as well as uh, the head of the Center for Conflict Analysis at Umm Durman Islamic University. He has, uh, he has got a PhD in political sciences from the Umm Durman Islamic University, and his paper will focus on uh, uh, the uh, Iranian uh, role in the region and its uh, role in affecting the identity of the GCC countries. You've got 15 minutes, please. The floor is yours. As uh, a matter of fact, uh, I would like to salute you. Good morning. If uh, the uh, uh, presence of Iran has uh, been related to the security issues, this paper will be talking about the consequences of such emergence on the question of identity in the GCC and in Saudi Arabia in particular. In particular. And uh, to understand such emergence and to answer thereby by the GCC uh, countries vis-à-vis -vis such uh, policies. Uh, the policies of the identity is uh, to do with what takes place in the region and in the international arena. We'll be talking about uh, the Iranian revolution as well as uh, the increasing role of Iran. The uh, showdowns uh, took place uh, in the Ba'athist and the Nasserite form. The question was postponed in the Arab world vis-a-vis uh, the Iranian question. In the current days, there are a number of determinants. Uh, the intersections thereby will uh, form the identity policies, or perhaps uh, some of them are internal that are embodied in the desire of the denial, uh, uh, especially post the 2011 Arab Spring, as well as uh, another uh, uh, point of view that talks about the showdown with Iran, especially after the collapse uh, and of Baghdad. Uh, this paper will uh, uh, follow uh, the Saudi Arabia and uh, uh, some other countries whereby they resorted uh, to have uh, this showdown uh, postponed and uh, to resort to the emphasis on the Sunni element vis-à-vis uh, -vis the crystallized Shia component. So this paper talks about the identity policies and it alluded to the fact that the formation of identity is to do with an ideological kind of uh, 
uh, prospect and it uh, creates identities uh, on a daily basis. And this, uh, as Mibshara, Dr. As Bibshara has uh, recharged such a, a concept. Uh, and it has different dimensions, uh, sociological dimensions, whereby the term uh, can uh, uh, convey the matter from the anthropology uh, perspective uh, into the political sciences. Uh, this uh, identity is an argumentative kind of fruit, uh, and uh, uh, thereby uh, those who contradict such identities might contradict themselves. So the identity compels the re production of a foreign enemy whereby the bond of the society can be created through the hegemony of some people whereby the authority can be legitimized in acting uh, uh, such uh, uh, in such manner to uh, form such identity I'll uh, uh, be brief and I'll move to the Saudi uh, status uh, uh, the, there are some uh, uh, willing of hegemony when it comes to the identity of Saudi Arabia and this ought to be excavated and uh, the discourse of such identity discourse is one of the components of the ideal ideo Realization, whereby Saudi Arabia can maintain its uh, 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 hegemony and show and make showdown with the enemies. Uh, this paper has talked about the facilitators of the Saudi Arabian identity has legitimized uh, such a, a discourse in the mirror of Iran. Uh, these uh, 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 people in the uh, discourse, uh, the ideological discourse, the resorted to the religion vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the Shia. Uh, uh, component of the Iranian uh, land, whereby the product at the end of the day can uh, uh, be uh, 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 described uh, as uh, a Sunni crystallization and denounce what is non-Sunni. And this took place uh, after the 1979 revolution. The Saudi, Ar Saudi Arabia has become the mirror of Iran uh, and uh, uh, this uh, conflict uh, 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 was entrenched in the uh, recent years. The Shiaism uh, is, uh, 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 or perhaps relates to the pan-Iranian kind of discourse, uh, and it is to do with the Iranian nationality. And since uh, the revolution uh, has been incepted, the uh, discourse, uh, Islamic uh, narration, the Saudi one, resorted to the Sunni nuances. Uh, so. Uh, we cannot uh, differentiate uh, now between the uh, uh, Saudi nationalism and the Saudi uh, religious uh, uh, nuances. So there is a kind of a cold war between the Saudi Arabia and Iran, and they both relate uh, to the religious uh, nuances. And uh, we have uh, some uh, commonalities in the discourse itself whereby uh, the two spheres are uh, confronting. After the fall of Baghdad in 2003, this discourse uh, will be emphasized, uh, and uh, the inflammatory discourse uh, also will be uh, emphasized in order to face Iran. Uh, and uh, after having an absolute uh, dissociation between the Sunni sphere and the Shia sphere, Saudi Arabia will position itself as the center of the Sunni Islam that uh, is in a showdown with the Shia Iranian aspect of uh, Islam. So this uh, public or mass discourse is entrenched and it is sometimes being holy. Saudi Arabia is a Sunni state. It is the protector of Sunnis and that's why uh, not only uh, Sunnis in Saudi Arabia ought to support Saudi Arabia but all the Sunnis across the world and that's why the uh, uh, rulers uh, of Saudi Arabia will crystallize such a school of thought and it will be embodied in the state of modern Saudi Arabia. In the, uh, uh, in the Arab Cold War, the policies of the new identities will have uh, internal objectives, uh, i.e., in accordance with the, my interpretation, to rephrase the religious sphere and uh, to uh, quell the uh, rebellions uh, uh, or the intransigence uh, whereby people can move outside the sphere of the official religion. Uh, some of the ideas of turning religion into ideology was uh, to uh, stave off uh, any disintegration with the kingdom. 
Indeed, it had cracked uh, in the 90s, but uh, it was saved off. Uh, the Mufti and the Grand Scholars uh, supported the royal family, whereby obedience is entrenched and the awakening trend has taken place, uh, and also the jihadi trend uh, has also surfaced. Uh, so the reemergence of such bond was important, uh, whereby religion played a major role in this bondage. And it was an attempt to invest uh, uh, all the uh, those who object what takes place in Saudi Arabia uh, with the theory uh, of obedience between two brackets. Uh, in the 80s, uh, the authority in Saudi Arabia has utilized the Islamic unifying discourse in order to entrench its uh, image as the defender of uh, the Muslims as the liberator of their lands. Uh, Afghanistan, for example, resembled the platform in order to entrench this uh, uh, approach, and it has uh, indeed uh, opportunities to legitimize the royal family's rule. Uh, but this uh, was uh, 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 volatile when uh, uh, the first Gulf War took place and the Americans came to the region. Uh, 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 the uh, uh, creed of loyalty was uh, uh, indeed uh, destabilized uh, in uh, the Afghan war as well that was halted. Uh, things uh, went to get pear-shaped. When it comes to the uh, uh, showdown between Tehran and Riyadh, those uh, who took uh, the helm of the awakening play a major role in uh, what follows. They were the only people who were able to have a rev revolutionary inflammatory discourse, uh, especially after June 2006. They were important uh, to counter uh, uh, this uh, revolutionary discourse with another, the Salafi traditional discourse against Abdul Nasser, Nasser's Egypt, and, they, that, and thus they were very important for the regime. Uh, following uh, the uh, containment uh, of uh, the awakening, uh, a number of reciprocity take, took place between the regime and the awakening, whereby the grassroots uh, uh, movement can be entrenched. Uh, so, in order to legitimize uh, what is taking place, uh, the awakening uh, people uh, 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 played a major role in uh, countering the Shia ideology. There's also another determinant that we cannot turn a blind on. It is to do with the emergence of the jihadi trend. If the policy of the identity has played a major role in the, this rapprochement, but when it comes to the uh, Salafi jihadism, uh, it failed. It couldn't contain it, but it uh, rejected it, and they were defectors. So, in contrary with the first wave in Afghanistan, whereby the Saudi Arabia has supported the jihadis, the Arab Afghans, as they were called, to legitimize their presence, the second wave of uh, jihadism uh, has, has been playing a role outside the realm of uh, the uh, regime. Uh, the emergency of the higher national uh, jihadism has uh, uh, indeed uh, disintegrated some of the ideas in an unprecedented fashion. Uh, the 11th of September uh, uh, events, for example, came within a, a strategy that was universal. Osama bin Laden uh, 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 was uh, the main actor in that episode. And indeed, uh, they were talking about uh, 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 tackling the issue of the far enemy rather than the internal enemy. And they talked about the matter in a unified manner, i.e. the uh, violence that took place is codified uh, in religion from their own interpretation of Islam. Uh, so what takes place in the reproduction of the classical jihad was something of the past. The new trend of uh, jihadism has uh, depended on the Sunni nuances and they uh, 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 dealt with the matter uh, when they tackled the far-reaching enemy, uh, i.e. Iran in the first place and also the Shia of the uh, societies of the Arab world. Uh, Osama bin Laden has uh, played a major role in uh, propagating the message of fighting the Jews and the Crusaders. However, now the Sunnis uh, have uh, a front in order to fight Iran and the Shiism. So the universal jihadism has been uh, morphed into a Sunni jihad whereby the uh, Muslim Sunni 
uh, plays a major role in fighting the enemy that is close uh, to him or her rather than the far-reaching enemy. In 2013, those who coordinate the new wave of jihad will uh, uh, indeed uh, uh, recruit uh, youngsters in order to follow the jihad in Syria. Uh, they have recruited a new generation under the emblem of uh, supporting the Syrian Sunnis. Uh, this paper has uh, talked about this as the third generation of jihadism. And lastly, if uh, some people are warning us of such violent trends that started in Afghanistan and went through the second generation and the third generation and those who support the Sunni Syrians, they supposed to be the enemies of the, not the Soviet atheists or the American crusader, but nowadays the non-Sunni Muslim. This inflammatory work uh, plays a major role in the strategy of uh, combating the emergence of Iran. But this paper has said uh, it is far-fetched uh, than true. These policies have been transformed gradually into a crisis uh, that uh, uh, targets the state itself uh, where these jihadists uh, work. Uh, this case that we are tackling relates to a political society that uh, 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 legitimizes itself uh, on the basis of the disintegration of the same society. So these policies, if they were successful uh, in uh, uh, providing a unified Sunni uh, m a grassroots in the uh, short wave, it will fail in the uh, midterm because this is unsustainable and it will transform into uh, something that relates to a discourse that is inflammatory between the groups uh, that are supposed to be national. And uh, this black hole uh, that sucks everything uh, in our world, uh, uh, then we will reach uh, the world that will go peer shape. I've got 20 minutes for a discussion, and I hope that your interventions wouldn't take longer than three minutes, because I am asked to end this session at 10.45. Dr. Anwar. Dr. Anwar Majd from KSA. My question. First of all, I would like to thank the panelists for their different papers, which most of them concentrated on diagnosing the situation. I would like to ask Dr. Ali Fakhru, and I would like to tell him at the beginning, when the Arabs wanted to expel the colonizers, they called for Arab nationalism, and they talked about its racial component. We didn't resort to the cultural source that invites all parties, so whether they come from different religions or different uh, racial origins. I think the fact that we haven't been transformed as we should have is the reason behind the problems that we are facing in the Arab world, and particularly in the GCC countries. Dr. Walid. Thank you. I've got two questions. One about Dr. Ali's paper and one about Dr. Asma's paper. A few years ago, I wanted to go to a police station in London, and I found that the head of the police station was a, an Egyptian officer, and we spoke in Arabic at great length. And I went back, to ho I went back home, and I asked myself, this Egyptian officer, is he less nationalistic than the other British officer who is sitting next to him in the same office? This is a question that is worthy of thought. 
is loyalty and national allegiance to the modern state in the meanings that we find in the different political literature is equal to be part of history and uh, language to be an Arab in your own country? Does it equal to be a nationalistic? I think this is a very serious question. We talked at great length about uh, policies of uh, nationalization, naturalization, and we always talk about non-Arabs. Do we have a mature call, invitation to nationalize, naturalize Arabs in the GCC, which means to give them citizenship? Is this going to be a kind of a constant strategy before we talk about needing others? Are Arabhood and nationalism, are they part of the idea of citizenship in the world in the modern world? Dr. Asiri? Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Mr. Asiri from Kuwait University. First of all, I would like to thank the Arab Center for Research for convening this very important conference that precedes the GCC summit, and we hope that the recommendations that would emanate from this conference would be given to the heads of states who would be convening in this summit. So I have a comment about the research paper that was presented by our colleague from Sudan. I would like to add two different dimensions, talking about the relationship between the Arab world and Iran. And I think maybe he thought this component is not very important. I think the uh, nature of the relationship is traded in the these two traits. Uh, so we have racism and uh, sectarianism. So many. Arabs think uh, that uh, the Al Fors, uh, the Farsis, the Iranians are Majus, which means that they are uh, believers or worshippers of fire. And my brother said that the Saudi Arabia has lifted the banner or slogan of a Sunni state that uh, protects the different Islamic. Uh, uh, holy uh, holy sites. These holy sites are not particularly Sunni. They are for Shiites and for our, all uh, Muslims. And this is one of the problems that we have been inflicted with in the Muslim world and that we are being taken advantage of in different parts of the world. Is that the end of my intervention? Yes, thank you. The gentleman behind Mr. Ibrahim, our colleague from Oman. Thank you very much once again. I would like to thank the Arab Center for Research. We listened to Mr. Muhammad. Uh, my name is Muhammad Saad Al Muqaddam from Oman. We have listened to the intervention by Mr. Ali Fakhru, who talked about uh, migration. And he talked about development in the GCC countries. And he gave us a number of figures. So the increase in the number of population, non-Arab population, non-GCC population, is closely linked to the development that is taking place in the region. And in that sense, we see that the decrease in the prices of oil, and God knows when uh, to what extent this is going to continue and to what extent this is going to have an impact on the economy because this, these workers uh, are closely linked to the development of uh, these states. So to what extent? So many countries are calling for uh, recruiting nationals in these kinds of jobs, but to what extent can these nationals want uh, to take such a jobs? Uh, so uh, Obama, when uh, he uh, called for uh, the uh, recruitment or uh, giving citizenship to in excess of 11 million in uh, 
uh, in the United States of America. So to what extent can we apply that here? Amjad Jibril, a Palestinian uh, researcher, I would like to ask Mr. Ali Fahru about something very particular, what I understood from your intervention, that you're talking about a political problem. Is this a cultural problem? Is it far more greater than uh, politics? When we talk about identity, it is a kind of a circle that keeps on uh, showing up. So that uh, means uh, it is a strategic cultural issue. I would like to ask a question about the regional system that is being reformed. Uh, so why does it target the different Islamic political moderate movements? And I'm talking about Muslim Brotherhood or other groups in parallel with the fact that they are kind of uh, forming a new identity vis-a-vis -vis Iran and Turkey, although Turkey is a Sunni state. So uh, the problem is not uh, against Shiites. It is against any other group uh, that wants to reform the region. Saudi Arabia particularly doesn't want that. So the lack of such a kind of a strategic vision creates uh, great problems. What I would like to ask also, what is the state that you expect that can contribute uh, to the forming of such identity or as, at least give us traits of such an identity. I would like to call for the development of GCC and Arab identity for it to be much more open on Turkey and Iran. And I would like to ask uh, Mr. Ira, uh, Mr. Uh, Ali about uh, the uh, limits or restrictions of the uh, I commend Dr. Ali and Dr. Fatima uh, for speaking of the ID and the citizenship. Two things are lacking here. I lived in this region in the period from 1967 to 1971 when Great Britain was abrogating its uh, treaties for defense and foreign relations. The look was sideways. The look was in a rearview mirror towards Aden, towards Yemen Janabir. Uh, this is the first Marxist-Leninist state that has ever come to being in the Arab world. And the belief then was that this came on the backs of the Harakat Nikabiyah Hinak. Half the cabinet of Aden at independence were on the left. Some were Marxists, including Abdul Fattah Ismail. The fear was that if you provide the right to organize labor, to have trade unions as part of identity, as part of citizenship, this would surely lead to insecurity and instability and political challenges that none of the ruling establishment wished. It had nothing to do with ethnicity. It had to do with the voice of the Arabs, of the Arab, using these foreign labors and national local labors uh, to protest uh, for better wages, working conditions, uh, and relations with their employers. This fear that something similar could happen in the nine lower Gulf states is the background, is the context, and is the nature of something that uh, deprive the issue of citizenship and ID in the realm of organized okay. labor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much indeed, uh, Aisha Tay from uh, Durman University. Uh, I would like to thank all the panelists. Uh, I've got uh, only a comment vis-a-vis uh, -vis the expatriates uh, when Mr. Ali Fakhri talked about the workers and Dr. Fatima has talked about them as well. The uh, statistics uh, 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 demonstrate the fact that there is 16% uh, uh, of uh, the laborers uh, uh, in the Gulf uh, states. Uh, they speak more than 60 languages, and they come from uh, 70 different countries, and uh, uh, their children uh, study in more than 600 schools. We cannot imagine that this demography or these people uh, 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 do not affect the identity of such uh, countries. Uh, I would like uh, to ask Dr. Fatima and Mr. Ali the following. Would it be possible to say that, uh, albeit uh, this phenomenon is expanding indeed uh, in the Gulf states?
can I say that uh, the understanding the phenomenon indeed is not up to the standards in the Gulf uh, states? Uh, well, the microphone is not working properly. Uh, we do apologize. Dr. Abdullah Ashaiti. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to thank all the panelists. Uh, the papers were splendid, but we are regurgitating what we have uh, said a year ago. I think uh, the uh, the problem is to do with the culture. In all the countries, uh, the nationals are the minority. After the liberation of the Kuwait, uh, the Kuwaitis uh, resemble 50 percent, uh, uh, but now they are to the tune of 33 percent. Uh, so the question uh, that uh, is pertinent here, when uh, we had a soft security threat in the past, now there is a threat that relates to the identity itself. The mechanism that took place uh, 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 by the rulers uh, vis-a-vis -vis such threat was not up to the standards. Would it be possible for us to think that the Indian community in the Gulf uh, states uh, to the tune of six millions uh, more uh, in number than the inhabitants of five uh, uh, GCC countries save uh, Saudi Arabia? Would it be possible to imagine that? Dr. Ali knows uh, uh, these matters and he was uh, an ex-minister in Bahrain. Is there a sense of threat? It, is it a security threat? It is, is it a cultural, a sociocultural threat that we need to have a, plain, a plan in place in order to, to tackle it? Like the Saudization or the Emiratization or the indigenization per se. I met an official and he said to me that uh, these people are here to live and to gain money and they do not pose any security threat. Is this true? Thank you. The gentleman on this side. Assalamu alaikum, Agal al Bahili from uh, Riyadh. I would like uh, to thank all of you, the colleagues, the panelists, and the chairman. Dr. Ali, Dr. Ali Fakhru has uh, pinpointed the following. He said the governments do not have a vision or do not understand or do not take heed of what what is taking place. They take it with a pinch of salt, perhaps. The microphone uh, is not working properly. We do apologize. So this is what has been said uh, uh, by the Dr. Uh, Ali. I would like to remind the doctor of an essay he wrote uh, earlier. The, uh, those people who were advisors to the governments, uh, the governments uh, thought that they were in the opposition side, but now they are a part and parcel of the government. So the governments are still not listening. So what's the solution, doctor? The one that sits beside you, yes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I would like uh, 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 to say uh, that uh, uh, the photographers here ought uh, to perhaps move a bit to the side so that they cannot block or obscure our, our, our way or our view. This is, this is a technical issue, sorry. But I'm Zain Al-Fadil from Jeddah. And... Uh, Please get, get to your point, sir. As a matter of fact, I, I, I'm Zaid Al-Fadil from uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, from Jeddah. And uh, uh, talking about uh, identity is uh, very prickly. Uh, I come from uh, Al-Hijaz, from Jeddah. And I ask, are we talking about the Gulf identity? Or are we talking about an Arab identity? And hence, we need to understand this matter. Uh, the Gulf uh, countries uh, uh, lay great importance to the Gulf, per se. And I would like to conclude by saying that we, in the Hejaz, uh, and here there are people 
who come from Hejaz, uh, Dr. Anwar and uh, Engineer Al-Irida and others. In Al-Hejaz, uh, we were successful to have all the ethnicities, the minorities, the languages, and so on and so forth. We managed to have them in a melting pot a cultural melting pot whereby Arabism is a standard and religion is a basis. Thank you very much. Microphone, please, for uh, Mr. Abdullah al -Nibari. Thank you very much. Thank you for all the researchers. I think the issue of identity in the GCC countries, and that was to limit it to and I am petroleum and I am very proud of it. I'm part of a petroleum country and I'm very proud. So the main problem is how to divide the cake of uh, petroleum resources. So everything else is being used in order to please uh, the different populations. So because development is distorted, that is why we find that uh, there is concentration of authority in limited hands, and also we have the concentration of this kind of uh, nationalistic perception, not only in the Arab world, but also in the GCC countries. And we are in a kind of uh, division, either racial division or sectarian division. So Mr. Ali, you talked about uh, how to contain or integrate uh, uh, Arab uh, citizens. Uh, so this is a kind of an idea that was uh, or that saw the birth in the GCC countries. So there's a kind of uh, discrimination uh, vision vis-a-vis -vis all these Arabs in those GCC countries. So uh, Kuwaiti countries are being discriminated against and so and made distinct and also against other Arabs. Arab citizens who participate, participate and took part in the first development phase, they used to constitute a great, uh, uh, I mean, number. I mean, now they are not, uh, are they, they, they're discriminated against, even when it comes to university lecturers. So the main problem is the problem of oil. One minute. So oil maybe would last only for another 40 years. So now, how can we solve what is remaining now? What would be acceptable for the political authorities? Let's try to unify at least the school's curricula. In the United States, uh, there is a school curriculum. If we reach a kind of a unified curriculum, uh, if we have this curricula that can uh, develop a kind of an Arab culture, that, that can lead to solve what is remaining of this kind of distorted and teared up identity. So I have a long list. I'm going to take only two questions. And after that, I'm going to give the floor to the panelists uh, to answer the questions that have been posed. And then Dr. Shemlen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This session was very good, a good and strong beginning or start of the session. So the question, how can we retrieve and regain our Arab identity, the Arabs? are backward and we are all backwards so how can we regain and retreat this uh, identity and how can we regain and retreat this kind of islamic identity when we talk about daesh so the way we look into asians we look down on asians this is not acceptable we as oil producing countries we work and live uh, due to the efforts that are being exerted by Asians and all of a sudden we have found that we have changed the way we behave vis-a-vis -vis Asians and against also Arabs we are only rentier uh, countries that live on oil thank you very much microphone please microphone Yes, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Dr. Ali 
at the end of his intervention, he said that the GCC, um, Abraham al Bakir, he said that the GCC country systems do not understand what is taking place. And I'm wondering, is that true? Is this uh, that there is a greatest power that wants the region to be as it is in order to dilute uh, the identity, we would like it to be a kind of a multifarious uh, region. And uh, on the 6th of December, uh, Thomas Friedman said that uh, uh, Dubai did what the United States of Ar uh, America didn't do. And here the question to be posed, it is known th that the strategies of certain uh, GCC countries uh, uh, of uh, 2030 have been devised and set out by RAND Center. So I apologize. I have to give the floor now to the panelists uh, to answer the questions because the organizers of the conference have asked me that I should end this session by 10.45. I'm going to give the floor now to Dr. Asma. She has got two minutes. Thank you. Regarding the question specifically, I think that the identity regarding your uh, question uh, regarding uh, identity, it is a very important issue. And uh, you have given the example about an Egyptian officer who works uh, at the police station in the UK. There is a commonality. Of course, he held a British nationality, and he is applying the uh, British law. His use of Arabic, is it against Arabic language? Is it against national, uh, British nationality or not? So identity should have commonalities or common grounds. Uh, we should uh, uh, take the example of the French people. Uh, they have become more flexible, but they, are, they insist on talking to you in uh, French. Regarding the Indians and the Japanese, they insist on using their language, not only their language, but also their national uh, uniform. So uh, regarding uh, uh, looking down on uh, Indians working in this part of the world, unfortunately, and I have mentioned it, sometimes we think that w we are more important than others. Regarding the defeat, the defeat uh, was the past. The Arabs were defeated by weaponry, but today weapons are not the only way to succeed or to win. There's a bigger issue. Uh, the defeat is the lack of knowledge. Thank you, Dr. Ashraf. Thank you all. I had one question to answer. Regarding uh, dealing with Iran, uh, it focuses on ethnicity and the denominations. I don't think that KSA can uh, activate uh, or can work on the ethnic issue today. There's always another person. Uh, it's, uh, other people have focused on the ethnic groups. Uh, during the Iraqi-Iranian uh, war, uh, the Iraqi used the uh, ethnic uh, minorities against each other. Uh, when it comes to the uh, competition between uh, KSA, Turkey, and Iran, maybe we can discuss it uh, later. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, uh, it is uh, very clear that uh, uh, this topic is very important to many. I cannot answer all questions because there were many, but I would like to shed light on some main issues that I consider key. First of all, we should uh, do away with bilateral uh, bilateralism, uh, don't, uh, so either one or another. Uh, there's a unifying identity, uh, and uh, there are uh, sub-identities. Uh, uh, you can be shared, but uh, European, uh, you have a European identity. You can be socialist, but be European at the same time. So we should not create these contradictions between the sub-identities and the major unifying identity of uh, the 
Ummah, of the nation. So, uh, in a few days, I will be giving a speech in Beirut about the uh, convergence or divergence uh, about nationalism and the uh, national identity. You can like your country and uh, still uh, care about the bigger identity. However, uh, the most important thing is that any sub-identity should not uh, uh, become more important than the bigger identity because without a unifying identity, all other identities will be lost. Uh, so uh, the uh, Arab, uh, the uh, workforce uh, in the 70s uh, were 70 percent. Uh, today it has become 32 percent. Uh, the problematic issue is that political parties uh, that are controlling this region do not want to understand that uh, the issue of workforce or labor force should not be perceived as commercial and lucrative uh, business. So if, for example, I get a cheaper Indian workforce uh, uh, than the uh, Moroccan, I would choose the uh, Indian because my company insists that uh, it is a lucrative system. I, sh I, should give, I should get more time because everybody addressed the question uh, to me. So uh, the, this is a very old-fashioned, uh, limited way of thinking that doesn't take into consideration anything but this issue. This is why I have said big, uh, big uh, complexes. Uh, who are going to live in these compounds, uh, residential compounds? People who do not speak Arabic are going to live there and are not linked with the Arab identity. And some people or some countries give them 90, the right to uh, rent for 90 years. You can imagine what would happen in this region in the future. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to tell you all that uh, I have seen a, in a couple of days a program, TV program about Quebec and Canada. Quebec is a small region of Canada. And every other year, they talk about uh, their identity in Quebec versus their uh, general Canadian identity. So the issue of identity is not only tackled here in this part of the world, but all over the world. And I would like to, th to remind everyone that uh, this problematic uh, can be tackled at the level of Qatar and Bahrain only. It is uh, problematic about the demographic issue uh, that is the heart at the heart of the identity of this region. It is linked with political decisions. It is linked with uh, uh, the uh, countries, different countries. So, uh, for example, our governments, why do they not train, uh, qualify Arab labor force and do away with this whole issue? It needs a political decision. In 2004, a recommendation was presented to heads of states and uh, it uh, asked them to take a unified decision that any foreigner, non-Arab person does not work for more than six years in this part of the world. This recommendation wasn't taken into consideration and wasn't implemented. And Russia had a strategy, they had a strategy and they implemented it. Now we are always talking about the issues of Iran, the power of Iran and Syria and um, Egypt and saving the Egyptian regime and we are busy doing so many things. However, when it comes to the core issues of this war, they do not or we are not tackling it. The national sovereignty in the 80s was far less uh, stressed upon uh, compared to now. Uh, I am uh, very uh, free to express my uh, position vis-a-vis -vis the situation in Syria, Iraq, etc. I know that uh, we're lacking time. I think that the solution is that these Arab societies, these Gulf societies, start playing their major 
key role regarding not only this topic but other topics as well. Without this key role, this problem cannot be solved. We should stop for a break very soon. Dr. Fatma, in order to find solutions to the issues of uh, identity and citizenship, I will start uh, by what Dr. Shamlan said last. We should change the social culture. We do not uh, want to do away with the Asian labor force uh, if our youth is not ready or are not ready to work uh, or do their jobs. So. Uh, we always talk about the Asian uh, workforce in our countries and we say that they dominate the uh, key aspects of the economy. Yes, indeed, from groceries to banks. However, when our uh, youth become ready uh, to take charge uh, from the minor to the higher uh, positions, uh, we will be able to find a solution to this crisis. Regarding the nationalization, uh, I think uh, that it is a political tool, not more. Uh, these countries do not uh, uh, take uh, this uh, issue seriously. It is only a political weapon in most of the GCC countries. Thank you, Dr. Fatma. At the end, I would like to thank you all and thank the panelists who presented their papers for uh, their good cooperation with the chairman. And uh, I would like to thank you for your contributions and valuable uh, questions. And I would like to apologize from the people who could not ask. We will have another session at uh, 11 o'clock in Dusail 1, Dusail 2. Thank you.